Thank you, Barb. Ohayo gozaimasu. Ohayo gozaimasu, I said. Oh, yeah, there's no Japanese people here. Good morning. I should have made Arnie Carey go after me. Hard to top that. Seriously, two weeks ago I was ready to smash this cup. But somebody gave it to me as a gift, so it's important to me, it's not what's on it, it's why I have it. So. <laughs> Nobody really cares about the stupid bowl, do they? Since, <laughs> since the Packers aren't in it. But we'll watch it anyway. So next week, if you can, bring your stuff. We're going to do some work around the church. Um, we really appreciate it. it. won't take long. It's just simple cleanup, maintenance kind of stuff. Uh, we really appreciate if you guys could participate in that. Well, we as Christians are called to be disciples. And I think Christianity is not very successful at making disciples. And the reason I say that is that consistently surveys of people who say they are Christians, they don't live a lifestyle any different from people who don't say they are Christians. In other words, if we're going to say we're Christians, there should be something different about us, about the way we live. Yet people when they, who call themselves Christians typically, by and large, don't live any differently. A small percentage do. You could call them the disciples. That's what God's looking for. People who are dedicated to following Him. Now, to be a disciple, you have to have discipline. You have to practice self-control. That's one of the characteristics of a disciple. And that includes mental discipline. We have to be clear in our thinking. And the Bible says this, 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, nope, forget that. Leave that on. Skipping that. It's a new year. So we're going to look at foundations of our faith, our essential beliefs, right? What do we believe? Uh, it's kind of like renewing your vows. You may be married. You've been married a long time. Sometimes people renew their vows, right? They haven't stopped being married. They haven't stopped their vows, but they renew them. And that's kind of like love life. You may be married and been married a long time, and things may be going good, but this is a way to maintain or make it even better. So I encourage you to participate in love life too. So the foundation of our faith is belief in God, that God is. And to me, I would say there's no more obvious fact in life that God is. If you look around at the place we live in in particular, how beautiful it is. Could this have come about by accident? Because basically, that's what you're saying. If you're saying there is no God, all this complexity, all this sophistication just happened by accident. Is there any experience we have in life where we see something sophisticated, complicated, and good result by accident, by doing nothing, by leaving it alone? I've never seen that. The grass doesn't get cut when I leave it alone. It gets longer. It gets messier. Well, I don't cut the grass, actually. Kai does, my son. But right, it's not going to get neater and cleaner by leaving it alone. We have to be involved. So there is a God. And Proverbs 10, 9, 10, we are going to read this one, says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So this idea that we should fear God, as we started talking about last week, is based on this idea that God is holy. God is perfectly righteous. There's nothing shady or, or uh, questionable in God's character. He's perfect. He always does everything right all the time. Um, and he hates sin. He hates it because it always destroys. It always causes bad things. Now, it promises to give us something good. And it might for a little while, but it comes at a far greater price than anybody should be willing to pay. Now, because you and I are all sinners, game over, right? If God is a holy God who must punish sin and we're all sinners, then we're doomed, basically, right? We're going to be punished. So we have a right to fear God. But I think it's important that we try to understand what sin is. A lot of us have trouble with that idea. Are we sinners? I'm a good person. I obey the rules most of the time. I only go five miles over the speed limit, right? Not 15 like the rest of you guys. I have found that if you go only 10 miles over, you're not likely to get a ticket. Or at least I think that's the case. I, I go the speed limit all the time. 
Pastor Tim Keller, this book talked about sin. We think it's breaking the law, but it's a little bit more than that. So it isn't so much breaking a moral law as it's trying to find our identity and everybody wants to find their identity. They want to know who am I and what gives my life purpose. Every person wants that. Every person needs to know that. What do I connect to that makes me know I'm important, that I have a purpose? To sin is to connect to something other than God. To connect and, and relate to something that gives you purpose, whether it's your job or a relationship or your money. Something other than God and say, that gives me identity. That gives me purpose. Is to find an identity apart from God. Say, God, I don't really need you. I find satisfaction in my life without you. I find meaning and purpose, and I don't need you. And it's essentially to make something that isn't God, God. That's what sin really is. And to have faith is to find our identity in a transparent relationship with God. That God, I need you, I connect you, and I find my purpose and identity totally in you. That's what it means to have faith. So it's reasonable for a sinner to fear God because God is holy and we've done something wrong. Now that's a good thing that God punishes sin. It's good for all of us. We don't like it, but even if we've done something wrong and God corrects us, that's a good thing. We should actually take joy in that. God is blessing us when he does that. Amen? Amen. So we could be a Christian, we could even be saved, but we have a reason to fear God's wrath, if we sin carelessly, if we're careless about sin. And uh, the description in Romans that tells us this. So God, he wanted the whole world to follow after him, and he never got it. They kept rebelling over and over. So he said, you know what? I'll start with one guy. I'll take this one guy, Abraham, and through him, I'll make a nation of people, because this guy will follow after me. And so everybody that comes from him will follow me too, and I'll make a people through him that follow me. And through those people, I'll bless the world. And those were the Jewish people. And Jesus himself was a Jew. And, and God's intention is that the Jewish people would follow and believe in Jesus the Savior. And the first Christians were Jewish. But as a nation, they did not. They rejected Jesus. And so non-Jews became Christians. And Paul says this to them, because they started getting a little cocky. Hey, man, now we, the Gentiles, the non-Jews have God, and they don't. So he said this, in Romans 11:20, 20, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And he tells them that if, hey, if you sin, you're in the same trouble. The same thing will happen to you. So even though we're Christians, even though we're saved, we have reason to fear God if we sin carelessly. So, um, if we resist temptation, that's good. All of, us, all of us have a sinful nature. There's things that are wrong that we're attracted to. I certainly am. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'll, but I am, and I know you are too. I don't have to know you to know that there are things that are wrong that appeal to us. We are tempted by them. We want to participate in them. And there's a wrestling match going on, and, and we are meant to win that wrestling match and don't do the thing, that's good. Let's say we're tempted to sin, tempted to do something we know we're wrong, is wrong, and we don't. That's a good thing. But the reason we do it is important too. And I've been facing temptation at times recently, and, and I resisted. I did the right thing, but when I examined, why did I not do it? The reason why is because I didn't want to experience a punishment that goes with it. I had the fear of God. I felt, God ain't going to let this go. Somehow or other, I'm going to experience a negative consequence. So I did it because I didn't want to get punishment, right? But, and if we do that, if we don't sin for that reason, that's good. But there's a better way. There's a more excellent way. So let's take the classic example of a hot stove. Right, uh, and uh, you all know, we all know we're not supposed to touch a hot stove because you get burned. So just imagine, it's me and my wife, our kids are little, and we take them and we want them to be careful. So we, we take them to the stove and we teach them, we say, this stove is a good thing, it helps us uh, make food, it's, it's a good thing, but it's dangerous too. 
You don't want to touch it. If you touch it, you're going to get burned. You're going to get hurt. And I don't want you. We don't want you to get hurt. We don't want you to get burned. Do you understand? They tell us, yes, we do. And that's the end of the lesson. Now, maybe you're one of those kids that you're alone now and you find yourself with an idle moment and there's the stove right in front of you. And you're wondering about this thing. Is it really hot? You're one of those people who has to find out for yourself. I have a child like that. I'm sure every family does. And they're tempted. They want to know, is this for real? And they're wrestling with it. They were told not to do it. They know it's wrong to do that. And so let's say they don't. They resist because their thinking is, they said it's hot and I'd get hurt. So they don't because they don't want to get hurt. Their thinking is, I'm not going to do that thing I want to do because I don't want to get hurt. That's a good thing. They've resisted temptation. But let's say uh, a child is in the same situation. They're alone. They're drawn. They're tempted to do this thing they know they're not supposed to. Sometimes it's just because you're not supposed to do it that you're tempted to do it, right? And they are wrestling with this thing. And their thinking is, wait, mom and dad said, if I do that, I'll get hurt, and they don't want me to get hurt, and I don't want to hurt them. And so I'm not going to do this thing because I don't want to hurt them. So in one way, you both have done the right thing, but for two different reasons. One did it because I don't want to get hurt. Still did the right thing, but their reasoning was I don't want to get hurt. Second person also did the right thing, but their thinking is I don't want somebody else to get hurt because of what I do. Two different reasonings for doing the same thing, right? Um, see, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end of wisdom. And if we do the right thing out of fear, that's good. We've done the right thing, but there's a better way, a better reason to do the right thing. And that's the verse we're gonna look at today will kind of reveal that to us. We're gonna be in 1 John chapter four, And it says this at verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him or lives in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides or lives in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So John is talking about perfected love. And in perfected love, there is no fear. Now, we are told very clearly to fear God. We have a reason to. We are sinners. If we do wrong, we have a right to fear God, what he may do. God is a righteous God. He must punish sinners. And that's a good thing for us and for everybody. But as we mature and grow, and that's what's intended to happen, that we become mature in our faith. It's, it's very immature. The reasoning to do the right thing so I don't get hurt, it's good, but it's immature. And God wants us to mature in our relationship with Him. And so our reasoning for doing the right thing should not be because of fear of punishment. No, this was written by John, the disciple who was mature in his faith. He wasn't always like this, but he grew to mature in his faith and his relationship with God. And it became so that he was no longer um, basing his relationship on fear, but he was confident in God's love. And the sign of God's love to us is that his spirit lives within us. He comes to dwell in us. And 2 Timothy says this, and the King James may say it best. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So what does this mean then for us in terms of love? And I know some probably question, we tried to do projects for this school, like next Sunday. And some question that, I think, why do we do that? Why do we take time to give to this school? It's a business, we have a business relationship. We pay them, 
They give us access to this room. That's the nature of it, right? And we fulfill our end, they fulfill their end. But we're trying to go beyond that. So next week we're gonna, they didn't ask us, we asked them, what can we do to bless you, to bless this school? We asked them. And, and what's the, what benefit do we get out of it? And I'll, I'll just tell you, I think there is benefit. Uh, and what I've gotten from, from doing it together, one is you get to work side by side, I hope with one of you. I, I get a lot of joy and satisfaction of spending time together with you guys joking around, just doing something. It creates an opportunity for us to spend time together. Uh, I think you get something out of that, right? We can also get the satisfaction, hey, we've, we've given something away. We've blessed the school. The school is better for us being here. Yeah, we pay rent and we cover our end. We fulfill our part. In fact, we overpay just because some psycho guy sued the schools, right, for um, they didn't follow the rules exactly. And that was wrong, but, I mean, he punished everybody. So we overpay just in case. We don't want to take the chance. So uh, we usually pay a little over just to make sure we don't violate our time. But none of those are good reasons for what we do. The real reason that we should do this is because God has blessed us, God has loved us, God has, it says that we lack nothing, that God has given us everything. So in other words, God, as Christians, God has given us everything we possibly need and a lot of stuff we want besides. We are filled up. We are right with God. We are blessed. And so in response to that, we want to show that love to other people. And that's one way we can do it is to serve this school. They may not know that. They may not even think that way. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. Our job is to, to give, to show God's love. Just as God showed it to us, our job is to show it to other people, to demonstrate it. That's our reasoning for doing it. Amen? So I, I'm sure next week we'll all be in our um, bus up clothes, right? In church, because we're going to help. You know, if you can. I, I truly believe this. I'm not asking anything from you. I've said this before. I don't think I'm asking something from you. I think I'm giving something to you. When I, when I talk about these opportunities, it is a gift to you, I believe. Because when I participate in these types of things, I'm the one that gets satisfied. I'm the one that gets blessed. Maybe I'm giving it away, but I'm the one that gets deep satisfaction out of it. I hope you can experience that. We talked about fasting at the beginning of the year. And I know not everybody, when we first started this church, was on board with that idea. But again, I wasn't trying to take something away from you. You don't do it for me anyway. I was really trying to give something to you. And I hope that you've experienced that there's a, something that comes with that, that giving that up to pursue God, you get an experience that you cannot give otherwise. That to give that up, I actually get something better. To give up my time and my effort to serve this school, I'll get something far more than that. And that's the love of God in action. That's why we're a church. That's why we're here, to meet our needs. But not just that, to spread that love beyond these walls. Amen? So, um, how is it possible then, if God is a holy God and we should fear Him as sinners, and yet we experience His kindness and His love, how is that possible? Uh, you know, God here, He's absolutely holy. He cannot abide sin. Sin would destroy the world if He let it. If He let it go, it would rip everything apart, you and I included. It would destroy everything. That's the nature of sin. And God cannot allow that to happen. So is he like, I, have a, I work with teachers, that's my job. And unfortunately, what happens in our school system, not by design, and it doesn't always work this way, but the newest, most raw teacher gets put in the roughest, most difficult classroom because nobody else wants it. And uh, so I have a teacher right now who's struggling. He's in a very difficult, he's, he is essentially put in a no-win situation. He's, and it's not by design, nobody designed this way, it's just the way circumstances fell, that he's expected to teach 15 students five subjects in the same class period. Now, a skilled veteran teacher would be challenged by that prospect. You take a brand new teacher and ask him to do that, that's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And so, uh, 
a characteristic of a lot of new teachers is they want to be liked by their students. They want to make a connection. They want to be, they truly want to be a positive influence. But they fall into the trap, and I did as a brand new teacher. You work to make sure these kids like you more than you are their teacher. Your job is not for them to like you. It's not, but it's human nature. You want them to like you. So what he's, this, he has become permissive. He's allowed them to do things no other teacher allows them to do. And for a very short while, they were compliant with his wishes. Now, they're no longer compliant, and they're still doing, taking these privileges that he gave them. He made a big mistake. And we have to try to go back and correct that. That's very difficult. Well, is God like that? God is holy, and he can't abide sin, but he loves us, and he wants to connect with us. So, is he like that teacher? I'm just going to overlook the bad things they do and pretend they don't do it because I really want to connect with them. Is that what God does in order for us to have a relationship with Him? And no, it isn't, because He can't do that. And so it's important for us to remember, we have to experience for ourselves personally the love of God. That's what changes us. You have to be convinced that God loves you. Are you convinced of that? And God's evidence of that is the cross. And we have to remember that God has proved His love to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. So there, God's holiness and His love meet in one place. Cross, two parts, right? Cross and other. God's holiness, demanding a price for sin. Sin must be paid for, it must be punished. And yet God's holiness, I don't want to destroy these people I created, which they deserve. I want them to be preserved. I want to save them. I want to have a relationship with them. And so Jesus, on the cross, took that punishment. God's, all His penalty for sin fell on Jesus. And through that, we were able to receive God's kindness. So God didn't overlook it, like this teacher right now is overlooking bad behavior, because He wants them to like Him. God didn't do that. God paid for it Himself. He took the penalty, so we don't have to. And we have to think about that, embrace that, because God's demonstrating His love to us personally, through that cross, that our sins were paid for, all the things we did bad. I, I uh, had a rough week, because there's some way I just fell short. It was on my mind, it was heavy on me, but God forgives me, I, I screwed up, I made a mistake. But God's forgiveness is available, because He paid for that. I don't have to pay for it, it's already paid for. Now, if we come to that understanding and that conclusion, that's the foundation of our faith. That's the foundation right there, that yes, I am a sinner, but God has forgiven me, and I can have intimacy and relationship with Him. I just want to uh, close by telling you a story about a man named Rusty Woomer. He was born in 1956. He was born in uh, the hill country of West Virginia. And he grew up in a very poor family. His father was an alcoholic and he used to beat the kids. Um, he'd run away, his dad would find him, beat him up and bring him home. Well, to no one's surprise, uh, he grew up to be pretty rebellious. He got into drugs and he was always kind of uh, connecting with older men. He ended up dropping out of high school as a, a freshman and um, went to prison for the first time at 16. And, he was always connected with these older guys, these other better criminals. And he, even he knew he was looking for a father figure. Because he, he didn't have a connection with his own father. So he's looking for a father figure. So he connects with these older, better criminals that he's running with. Well, one time, this guy he buddied up with, they, they had a plan. They were going to rob this guy in another state, steal his coin collection, which they did. But they got totally stoned on every kind of drug you can imagine before that ever happened. And it turned into a killing spree. They didn't just stop at this guy's house where they shot and killed. Rusty killed the guy. But they went on and they, he murdered five people on that spree. And he ended up kidnapping and raping, shooting somebody else. The, the woman he raped, he shot her with the intention to kill her. He only shot off the bottom part of her face and she survived. Well, uh, Rusty Rumor was in prison. He went to prison, he was sentenced for the murders that he had committed. And a, a man was called by God to go to the prison. He's just a fairly new Christian, but he had a connection to the prison. He felt God told him, go to the prison and talk to these inmates. And he was on uh, death row. 
that's the ones he went to see. And he passed by Rusty's cell, and it was filthy. It never been cleaned. It was just disgusting. He's sitting there in the middle of the cell, and roaches are climbing all over him. He was despondent. He called his name, but he wouldn't respond until finally the guy prayed, and, and he said he felt like God told him, "Tell him to say the name Jesus." And he said, "Rusty, just say Jesus." And Rusty did, and he began to say the name Jesus. And and uh, when the guy came back. A couple days later, Rusty's cell was clean. Rusty had received Jesus, and his life had changed. This is a guy, he's a murderer, okay, on death row. And his life now is turned around. And this is what Rusty said about fearing God. He said, don't it scare you that someone loves you enough that he can forgive you for anything that you do? He said, sometimes, it scares me sometimes. His love is so strong that it might hurt us when we need him. I think he said that shortly before he was executed, before his crimes, he was killed. I think that's the fear of God that God is trying to give us to. Yeah, if we do wrong, we should fear God's righteousness. But far more fearful, I think, for most of us is the intensity of God's love, that God wants to love us in an intimate way that we're not comfortable with and don't want to experience. But if a guy like Rusty Rumor can experience it, then we all can. And not only are we meant to experience it, but it's meant to bleed out, to leak out of us, to pour out of us into the people around us. And though we may have heard this before and know this, it's a good reminder that this is the foundation of our faith, that we are sinners saved by grace. And, and uh, that never changes, that we may go on and grow in our relationship with Christ, but we are always there. We are always a sinner saved by grace. Amen? And from there we can build and grow and do lots of good things that God has called us to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for calling us, Father, when we were far from you. And whatever it is that led us to come to know you, just thank you. And praise you for that day. If it was trouble, uh, then we thank you for that, Father. We know that our relationship with you was initiated by you, started by you. And it means far more to you than it does to us. Father, would you give us that same concern, that same desire for you that you have for us, that intensity of wanting to love us. Could we love you just as much? Father, you said it is impossible to love you without loving other people. And so help us to do that, Father. Show us how we can love people. The people in our family, definitely. But Father, even the people that irritate us, the people we don't like and who seem to not like us, you want us to love them too. That's really hard, Father. And would you at least give us the attitude of willingness to love them, and would our hearts be open? And when you show us ways to love them, would you help us to do that? And Father, right now, I just pray a blessing on each person here that, that we could feel the fullness of your love, uh, just the intensity of that love, Father. And could it become the foundation on which we build our lives? And we'll maybe go out into this world and, and bring that love with us and, and uh, Make you famous, Father, because it's your love that we bring and not our own. And may you be glorified, we pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen.